Yes, I'm sitting on my doorstep Watching the people just pass me by Yes, I'm sitting on my doorstep Watching the people just pass me by all week long, Ryla Iceman Robinson works in a meat processing plant. But on Saturday night, he's a blues man. I'm gonna call Mr. President. I'm gonna call the Congress too. Yes, I'm gonna call home Mr. President. The money ain't there, the food ain't there, the clothes ain't there, the opportunity's not there. Hard times, bad connection, no pay, no money. You got the blues. <laughs> make me feel frisky, make me feel sexy. <laughs> it just make me feel good <laughs> to hear the blues. You got to move something. <laughs> you gonna move something. If you listen to them, some part of you gonna move. Miss Jones's Cocktail Lounge on Chicago's South Side. People come here to listen to the blues, music they first heard long ago as sharecroppers in the Mississippi Delta. The blues, stories of love, pain, hard times, the common experiences that bind these people together. I worked out my angle, happiness, love, and sorrows. I shoots all of it right through that guitar. I ain't going down that big road by myself. The Mississippi Delta, a patchwork of plantations and small rural towns, the heart of the Deep South. Millions of people from the great industrial cities of the North trace their American roots to this place. child who lived in the Delta, worked in the heat and dust of the cotton fields. And 70 years after the end of slavery, those who worked the hardest were the poorest, the sharecroppers. I started picking cotton around four years old. They would tie a little sack, you know, and hang it on my neck, and I'd put the cotton in there. When I get the sack full, and I'd dump it into my daddy's sack. And I would pick by my father and my baby brother. He would pick alongside my mother. We were just nibbling, but we was picking. We had to be there all day. And then sometimes we pick cotton and moonshine and ice. They was not fair. They would pay, in my day, a man 75 cents a day for 12 hours. Like a lot of sharecroppers, Eulis Carter grew up in a tiny shotgun shack surrounded by the cotton fields his family worked. We didn't have no streams to the windows, and neither do. The flies just come in, the mosquitoes and gnats and everything just come in and take over. We lived through that all of our lives. I remember one time I was plowing with the mule, and the mule was very hot, sweating, and this agent came up and he said, boy, uh, put the mule in the lot and let him cool over, and you go over there and where they are chopping and help them to chop. Well, he didn't realize I was hot too, just like the mule. 
that man think more of a mule than he'd do a human being. It wasn't so good at my day. Oh, Lord, will you hold, hold my hand? Have we tried? Have we tried? Never away. Oh, please be my guide. Will you stand by, by my side? Lord, will you help, help me make it through another day? Lord, if you please, help my father, I want to make it through another day. day. Lord, if you were a sharecropper, you worked from dawn to dusk. The plantation owned your house. Anything you bought, you bought at the company store. The boss man controlled nearly every aspect of your life, including when and if your children went to school. My mother was a kind of person that would defy all orders for us not to go to school. Each year we would have to move because she would send us to school rather than make us stay at home and harvest the crops. She said, there are 82 counties in the state of Mississippi, and if I have to move to a county every year, a different county, you all will be educated. Not far from the fields where she worked as a young girl, Alva Norfolk is now principal of a school. In 1937, we were living on a plantation out from Dublin, and my daddy came home about the 22nd of December. And my mother asked, you know, on the plantation, at the end of the year, they would settle with you what they call, give you what you made, you know, after every expense was taken out of it. My daddy came home about the 22nd of December, and my mother asked him, how much did we make? He said, we came out $50 behind. We had raised 17 bales of cotton, and uh, we still owed the planter $50. If you hold to my hand, every, every, everything will be all right. I never shall forget the look on my father and mother's face. They looked so helpless. I was about nine years old, I believe. And uh, my mother asked my father, she said, what are we going to do? He shook his head. He said, I don't know. <laughs> Sun up to sundown, whole families pick cotton, six and sometimes seven days a week, for little or no pay. The only things most sharecroppers could truly call their own were the church and their music. The first time I heard the music, I was a little boy, and it was something about it that made me want to be a blues musician. I remember my mama used to say, she used to get up and walk in the kitchen, and sometimes we didn't have too much of food to eat. She used to sing a little, oh, the Lord is my shepherd. Lord, and I share not one. Music meant a lot more than it do now. We didn't have the big instruments to play like we got now. So when you played blues then, sometimes we used to go to the string up on the wall and play. I don't need no back door man. Well, I don't need no, no, no back door man. All I want to drive blue from here on. After a long, brutal work week, everybody who was able headed to the juke joint, where just for one night, the local blues man helped them forget their troubles and hard times. They're still going to juke joints in Mississippi. Junior Kimbrose is in Holly Springs. You got me, girl. You got me where you want me, baby. Now, girl, I know you are satisfied. You got me, baby. 
Everybody was just laughing and dancing, lolly popping, and just having a good time. Forget everything. You didn't have no worries, no problem, no trouble, and whatever your worries or problem were, when you heard it blue, you, you forgot about all of that stuff. Blues tell you things. And uh, you something you might not want to say to a person. Certain blues you listen to a record, you go find the right one will tell that person exactly what you want them to know. They'll know where you coming from. Well, it's bad or good. Yeah, but it's one more thing I want to say right now, baby. Well, they would uh, go out and have a good time getting loose from the work and from the uh, problem that they had on their job. Some of them say, I done worked all the week, and um, tonight I'm going to let my hair down. Them working people. <laughs> When the sun came up on Monday morning, it was always back to the cotton fields and the brutality and heartache of the sharecropper's life. People's had a hard time. Eddie Burks grew up in Greenwood, Mississippi. In 1937, his brother Henry Lee was pumping gas for a local girl he was friendly with, a white girl. They were seen by the wrong people. I can remember it so good that night. I was laying up in the brass bed, and the wood come to the house. I, my mama started to cry. My daddy had come in early that night and told us, say, you know, I don't know why so many cars parked on this gravel road. Because he'd come in. They had cars from Memphis, so he said, Jackson, even as far as St. Louis, they'd come down to, to, to lynch him. And they tell me the high sheriff of Greenwood walked in the room, he was asleep. And he was the first one. He sh he, he shot all his bullets up, and then he walked out. Then his buddies, his deputies, they come in and they start to shooting, and then the other crowd. I can remember uh, one thing. They shot him so much till they had to take a shovel and shovel him up. Uh, I can remember that much. They'd take the shovel, shovel him up out of the room. That's how bad it was. We travel, and we travel this narrow way. Oh, please, my God, the Lord will stand by my side. Lord, Lord, will you help us to make it? I purposed in my heart that when I got old enough, I was going to leave and get out on my own. I just wanted to be treated like a man. For decades, Delta sharecroppers tried to escape this bitter existence whenever they could. In the early 1940s, two things happened that changed their world forever. One October morning in 1944, 
A machine was unveiled in Clarksdale, Mississippi. It was an automatic cotton picker that could be mass produced and would do the work of 50 people. Suddenly, a hard life got harder. But at the same time, the American war effort was creating millions of jobs in factories up north. Jobs available to everyone. Now the dream of escape seemed more real than ever. I went to the bus station to get me a ticket. And this young lady didn't seem like she wanted to sell me a ticket. Chicago, Chicago. She just kept on repeating, and I said, yes, ma'am, Chicago. And she waited on all of the white folks. By that time, the bus had come, and she sold me the ticket. I got on that bus, and I said, goodbye, Mississippi. <laughs> They traveled by car, bus, train. Some people even walked. By the early 1950s, over four million people had made the journey north to freedom. It was one of the largest migrations in the history of mankind. When I got to Chicago, within an hour, I had a job. So you see what a great difference it made. I wasn't no more boy. I was Carter. They called me by my name. It wasn't no boy. I didn't have to get off the streets and let them pass. I didn't hear no get off the move, I get off the street, nigga, or nothing like that. They paid, and if they bumped into me, they said, pardon me, I'm sorry. Jobs, opportunity, independence, a chance to own your own home, maybe even your own business, a real future for your children. To sharecroppers fleeing the Delta, Chicago really did look like the promised land. I thought how beautiful it is to live in the North. These people have fine homes, nice automobiles, and places of business. And it, it, it was just a scene like in another world. But all of those big, huge buildings and the streetcars, I could ride them. I never had rode one before. And it was an L train. I went downtown on the L. And when I got on that way up in the air then, I hollered, oh, they're going into that building. <laughs> it was a big step up because um, I was able to send money home two or three times a month. I could send them $6 home to my mama. Her rent was, I think, was a dollar and a quarter a week. So if I could get, uh, five dollars a month that would keep us staying and if i could get uh five or six more dollars that month that would keep us sitting at the house you wouldn't have to go to the field uh, on them real hot days and work so hard <laughs> In 
In cities like Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis, and Philadelphia, the grandchildren of slaves were able to earn a decent living for the first time. When I got to the city, that's all I needed then. I had it made to the city. Theaters, everything was there, beautiful lights. She felt free. It was real nice. You had so many places that you could choose to go in. The pride of black Chicago was the strip on 47th Street, lined with theaters and businesses, most of them owned by people from the neighborhood. Elegant was not the word for it. I wouldn't dare come to 47th Street without my hat on, my suit on, my purse, my gloves, and with uh, the right aroma on my body. And the men wouldn't dare to come to 47th Street without their shoes shine, with their uh, white shirt and tie and suit on. Everything about you was glowing. And it was always glorious. When folks from the Delta came north, they brought their music with them. For blues musicians trying to make it in the big city, the first stop was almost always the open air market on Maxwell Street. In fact, they're still playing the blues here. Chicago is now the blues capital of the north. One of the musicians who got his start on Maxwell Street is Eddie Burks. You really didn't have to have a band to go down there and make a couple bucks. I would go down there and get my little harmonica and get me a little box and set it down in front of me. All through the day, this one will stay a while and he may give you 15, 20 cents. Next one will come through. In a run of eight hours, that money would really count up. Everybody is clapping their hand, and, and you'd be saying to yourself, look what I'm doing. When you've been down all your life, and then you begin to see yourself moving on, you don't supposed to worry no more. You're supposed to rejoice. And the word rejoice means get happy inside, because I done come through this. I have been delivered. Things have changed. happy I'd be when I play the blues. Look like somebody have come to me and get inside of it and give me power and strength. few decades, Chicago and other cities of the North fulfilled their promise, but it didn't last. Everything is torn down. The buildings is all torn up. The parks is, don't look the same. The trees is all rolled down and everything. 
my first place where I lived was 4926 Indiana Avenue. And now it looks like ghost town over there. And I wonder why. I just really wonder why. By the early 1950s, the red brick factories that offered hope to so many started to close. When the jobs went, the money went. When the money went, the neighborhoods went. And the hopes and dreams of millions of people who traveled the blues highway looking for a better life faded. It's a proud thing to be able to work and not have to take hand out from nobody. Even though that uh, you wake up sometime and you be hungry, but you still get up and go on to that job and make that little money and bring it back home and hand it to your family. I hate to see such a beautiful place torn down. Downtown Chicago, Roosevelt Road, them were some of the prettiest streets you want to lay your eyes on. Now you walk down the street, tears will rise in your eyes. Cause if you just think back in the forest, how beautiful it was. And now you don't have nothing now. For people like Eddie Burks and Ulysses Carter, the lyrics and sounds of the blues have been their expression of tough times and broken promises. For everyone, it's a powerful echo that continues to be heard today. I get the blues sometime, and I start to sing it. I used to sing that song about trouble in mind, I'm so blue but I won't be blue always because the sun is gonna shine in my back door someday. Hey, yeah, blue. Oh, you know what you want to go. Climb, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know what you want to go. Way well, back to the land of California, to my sweet old Chicago. Find me, baby, don't you want to go? Find me, honey, don't you want to go? Way well, back to the land of California, to my sweet home, Chicago. Well, you know I give you all my money. You go downtown, get back in the evening. You want a dog pull on around the crying. Hey, honey, don't you want to go? Back to the land of California, to my sweet home, Chicago. No, 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 baby, down on my way. I know you're gonna need more. Learning one day, I'm crying. Hey, baby, not you want. We're back to the land of California, to my sweet home, Chicago. 